is, it is so wonderful. Fremantle, um, Hunter Valley. Wow, wow, wow. Well, welcome all of you. And um, it really is a privilege and honor on behalf of Mind Medicine Australia to welcome you to this very special webinar in our global webinar series featuring Professor David Nutt. And Professor David Nutt has been a supporter of Mind Medicine Australia's right from the beginning. He presented at our launch in February in 2019, and we were honored to have him then. And he's continued to support us through a range of webinars, uh, through our CPAT course, our Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies. He's supported us with our applications to the TGA as well, and many other many other documents and things as well. And um, I'm just trying to think of all the many ways, <laughs> just so many ways. And we're really grateful, David. We, we love you lots and um, you're just a legend. So <laughs> I well, think thanks. everyone's going to love um, your session today. And yeah. um, before I do introduce you, I just want to acknowledge the owners of the lands from which we all come, their elders past and present. I also want to acknowledge the medicine keepers, the light keepers, the people who have brought these medicines through from the beginning of human civilization to us today. We stand on the shoulders of giants, really we do with this movement. And David is absolutely one of those, but the people who preceded him as well are incredible. And um, it's gonna be fascinating hearing you speaking as always today. David. David has a wonderful talk also on the history of these medicines. I don't know how much he's talking about that today, but if he doesn't talk about it a lot today, we might do a session with you in the new year, David, around the history of these medicines. Yes. Today's the brain science. That was the brief. Yeah, yeah. Doing. No, that's good. We, we want to hear how it all I can do everything in 45 minutes. <laughs> it's a big topic. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, look, you know, how this works in the brain, I'm sure everyone's fascinated to learn about today, but um, Grace and Alan, we might put David down for a, a history session in early 2022. Okay, so um, what we're going to do, the, the format for today is going to be the following. We're going to show a very short introductory video to Mind Medicine Australia now, for those of you who are newbies. And for those of you who've been with us before, please, you know, enjoy it and please share this video. Alan will, or Grace will paste a link and you can share it just explains a little bit about us. Then I'm gonna do just a couple of intro slides about Mind Medicine Australia for those of you that don't know much about us. And then I'm gonna introduce David. He'll then present for approximately 30 minutes or so. Yeah, David? A bit longer. Yeah, well, I mean, if the... <laughs> yeah, carry on. No, no, but, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone would love you to- I'm pruning my, time. I've already pruned my talk by 50% since you cut it from 75 to 45 this <laughs> morning we're going to cut it again. no well, That's we're going to be, be delighted to hear from you as as long as you um, want to be on there and then but the, we want to leave as much time as we can david for q a i got That's it all. Yeah, all right. i won't linger over things don't <laughs> and um so we'll have, try and have plenty of q a so if you've got questions please post them in the chat uh we will try and work through as many of them as we can with a rapid fire q a after david's presentation okay so we're going to start off with the short video now please Ilan. That's the wrong video. Sorry, folks, that is the wrong video. But we will have the right one in a moment. <laughs> Ilan, do you have the right video there? No. Did you know that over 45% of Australians will experience mental illness in their lifetime? That's nearly half of us. Everything feels flat in my heart, sleep, and don't like Shame. Mental ill health devastates lives and families and costs Australians around $60 billion a year. Research and treatment expenses continue to rise, yet rates of mental illness indicate that we're losing the battle. New approaches are urgently needed to address this immense suffering and cost. Psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is currently being trialled worldwide and has demonstrated remarkable promise in treating depression, anxiety, addiction, and post-traumatic stress disorder, 
with new trials underway for treatment of dementia and anorexia. The treatment combines a short program of psychotherapy with just a few medicinal doses of psilocybin or MDMA. In the 1950s and 60s, psychedelic treatments had a major impact in psychiatry and many considered it the next big thing in mental health treatment. But for political reasons, the Nixon administration criminalised the use of psychedelics and effectively stopped all research. That research has finally begun again. With proper clinical support, psychedelic treatments are safe and frequently lead to remission after only a short program and even where current treatments have failed. Here at Mind Medicine Australia, we believe everyone should have access to the best treatments for mental illness. We will seek to establish best practice in regulated psychedelic assisted treatment. Mind Medicine Australia is wholly focused on the clinical application of psychedelic medicines. We're preparing for change by developing therapist training, ethical guidelines, a centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine, educational material and events, and supporting clinical research. We're a small organisation doing big things, and we need your support. Please share this video and visit our website to support us and get involved. So, Alan, I'll ask you now if you can put the short welcome slides um, on now for me and I'll just go through them very quickly. And if you have got questions about anything that MMA is doing, please also post that in the chat. So this session is entitled, How Neuroscience Put Psychedelics Back Into Psychiatry. And with Professor David Nutt, of course, who we've already said hello to. Um, just a reminder that we are focused on the clinical use of psychedelics. We are recording this session and it will go on our YouTube platform and we'd love you to share it widely. Next slide, thank you. Next slide. So these figures are pre-COVID and just two days ago in the Australian newspaper, um, some research came out which showed that up to four in five Australian adults are now suffering with increased anxiety and mental illness of some kind. This is as a result of the pandemic and the measures that have um, made things even more difficult for people. So pre-COVID we had one in five, now it's suggested that we might have four in five Australian adults who are suffering with some form of mental illness or anxiety and that's causing an enormous amount of also trauma for people. Pre-COVID one in eight Australians were on antidepressants including one in four older Australians and children as young as four years of age. Now Many of us know that in Australia, we've had this massive spike in youth mental illness through this pandemic with huge um, amounts of calls to helplines from young people wanting to end their lives um, who are self-harming and so on. And this is really, really concerning. Pre-COVID, it was suggested that one in two of us would experience a mental illness in our lifetime. Next slide, Alain. The elephant in the room is the lack of innovation and treatments for mental illness. So governments talk a lot about increasing access gateways, training more therapists, providing more telehealth sessions and so on. However, none of those things are actually going to make a difference if we can't get to the cause of a person's suffering. And the current treatments in general do not get to the cause of a patient's suffering. So you can see there the elephant's trying to get the attention of the bureaucrats and others. And um, hopefully we're helping to bring that elephant right into the room so that we can really start to focus on creating more treatments for practitioners and their patients. Next slide. So sadly, there has been no improvement in treatment outcomes for the past 50 years. In the case of depression, only 30 to 35% of sufferers experience remission from their depression, that means they no longer qualify for that diagnosis. And of course, the side effects are significant. In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, as few as 5% of sufferers experience remission through current treatments. So more of the same is not gonna solve the problem. We all know that definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. 
Next slide, thank you. So we are a registered charity set up by my husband, Peter Hunt and myself. And as I mentioned earlier, for those who weren't on the call, David Nutt um, was at our launch and spoke wonderfully at our launch in February, 2019. Our goal is to expand the treatment options available to practitioners and their patients. Our focus at the moment is on psilocybin for the treatment of depression and MDMA for the treatment of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. However, we are interested in the use of these medicines for other types of conditions, and um, we'll talk about that. And we're also interested in further research and development of other psychedelic medicines, like Ibogaine, DMT, Ayahuasca, LSD, and so on. For us, success means that these therapies become an integral part of our mental health system. So if you go to a medical practitioner, they'll give you a choice of current pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, or psychedelic assisted therapy with full disclosure on the risks and benefits of each type of treatment. Also, our aim is that these medicines continue to achieve the high remission rates which they've been achieving in the trials, which are between 60 to 80%. And there have been over 160 current and recent trials on a, using a range of psychedelic medicines that are showing consistently around about 60 to 80% remission rates. And of course, our goal is that these medicines and treatments are accessible and affordable to all Australians in need. Next slide, thank you. <clears throat> so the remarkable thing about these treatments, and David, I'm sure is going to explain why this works so well, is that these medicines only require about two to three medicinal sessions in combination with a short course of psychotherapy for a patient to become cured, to go into remission. So the medicines are not palliative. They actually are getting to the root cause of a patient's suffering and helping therapy to be fast-tracked. That's why it is called psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, and I'm sure David will explain more about that. But this is not the medicine on its own. It's the medicine in combination with the psychotherapy that creates these outstanding results. The medicines are considered very safe in medically controlled environments and non-addictive. Both have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in the US, and that's only given very rarely to medicines that could be vastly superior to existing treatments to fast track the approval process so that when the medicines go through phase three trials, they could become instantly prescribable provided that they continue to um, achieve the excellent outcomes they've been achieving in previous phases of those trials. Next slide, thank you. So um, look, I'm gonna, I'm sure David's gonna talk about this slide, aren't you, David? Are you? Would well, you want to talk about it briefly now? Because I love it. No, this. no, no. Uh, I'll build up to it. <laughs> You'll build up to it? Okay. Well, I hope you don't mind me just mentioning it briefly. Sure. Um, sure. I won't do it as well as you. But, you know, a lot of people do ask, how does this all work? And, of course, these particular medicines bypass what's called the default mode network of our brain, which keeps us defaulting to our usual rigid stuck patterns and repetitive styles of thinking. And you can see there representations of fMRI scans. And on the right, you can see the patient who has the depression. You can see the very limited neural connectivity that's going on with that patient. Whereas with the intervention of the psilocybin, you see this massive neurogenesis occur. You can start to see the hemispheres of the brain starting to talk to one another a lot more, increased neural plasticity as the patient experiences this sense of oneness and connection. And as many of you will appreciate on the call, often a definition of depression and mental illness is characterized by a sense of disconnection, a sense of separation, isolation, and aloneness. Many researchers describe these medicines as resetting or rebooting the brain or defragging the dodgy hard drive. You know, when you turn off your computer and all of a sudden all the problems and slowness you're getting is gone and all of a sudden your computer's working perfectly again. It's more, a little more complex than that, but David will describe it to you. And on these wonderful scans or these representations of these scans, there's actually the same amount of lines in both of these diagrams. It's just that one of them is really functioning well and one is not. 
But the wonderful thing about these medicines is they do provide a window in which skilled therapists can work with a patient to fast track the healing process and bring the insights that the patients get from these incredible experiences back into their lives. Many patients do describe these experiences as one of the five most meaningful experiences in their lives. Now, whoever says that about a medicine? Next slide, thank you. So the world in psychedelics is certainly taking off. We're seeing these medicines being used for a range of other conditions now as well and trialed for them like obsessive compulsive disorder, a range of addictions. They're starting to be investigated for stroke, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, also fibromyalgia and weight loss and dementia and eating disorders as those of you saw on the video. In addition, these medicines are becoming available through special access compassionate use schemes in countries around the world, including Australia, the SASB scheme, where the FDA in Australia provides access to a patient, uh, sorry, to a, a, a psychiatrist or GP prescribing doctor, specialist doctor on a case by case basis for a very ill patient who is treatment resistant to get treatments for these medicines now. So over 40 of these SASB approvals have been granted in Australia, but unfortunately the patients haven't been able to be treated because the state laws prohibit the substances from being brought in because they're still classed as recreational substances. So the states are not making a differentiation between recreational use and medical use of these medicines. Uh, so that's why we put in the rescheduling applications over a year ago, and many of you will have seen that the TGA came out with an independent review just a few days ago, which looked very prospective. It did actually reaffirm the therapeutic value and the safety of these medicines. And that is going to then go to a final meeting of the medicine scheduling committee in November, and then a decision will be made in December. So let's just all put our fingers and toes crossed now for that decision. In addition, the Australian government um, has granted a $15 million grant towards further research and development in Australia through our efforts in talking with Canberra um, last year and, and this year. So that's been a great sign and um, is the largest grant named by any federal government that I'm aware of. In addition, Oregon became the first state to legalise psilocybin for therapeutic use in uh, November last year. And many states are following suit. Next slide, thank you. So these two trials, and I think David's going to talk about the first trial. Are you, David? So, I won't mention talk, it. I'm going to talk about both of them. Oh, okay. I'm not going to mention them. Fantastic. Let's skip to the next slide. So final slide here is we are focused on building the ecosystem. So when Pedro and I started Mind Medicine Australia, there wasn't an ecosystem, there wasn't a way that we could get these medicines to people around Australia and create the protocols and training necessary to ensure that people could get these treatments in clinical environments. So we have four strategic pillars. One of them is awareness and knowledge building. And we have a range of education and events like this global webinar series and other webinars that we also do for a range of clinical groups, hospitals, universities, health insurers, and other businesses. So if anyone on this call is thinking, wow, you know, we'd love to learn more about this in our business or organization, please reach out and we can arrange for presenters for you. In addition, we've set up chapters all over Australia and New Zealand, and we'd really encourage you to join our chapters. If there's not one near you, you may also want to start a chapter in your region. And that is to build grassroots awareness and educate your communities, run events and film screenings and so on, to really start um, to, I guess, you know, get this movement out there. Uh, we can't do it all from head office. So we need to do it through decentralizing our efforts. In addition, we have a major international medical summit in November with really the leading um, researchers and doctors uh, in this space around the world. And Professor Nutt is presenting at that summit as well as some of the other leaders. We'll show you who soon. And we're also going to provide special discount code for you for that shortly. We've also started the first certificate in psychedelics assisted therapies in the Southern Hemisphere. 
and that has a world-class faculty, including Professor Nudd and many others. And that is for psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, GPs, physicians, addiction specialists, palliative care specialists, nurses, uh, paramedics, social workers, counsellors, etc. It's a wonderful course. Many people describe it as the best professional development training they've ever done, life-changing and so on. We also have other professional development programs including our fundamentals course, which at the moment um, is taking place and has had wonderful, wonderful um, reviews as well. And then we're looking at setting up the first Asia Pacific Centre in Emerging Mental Health Therapies in partnership with some universities. We're looking at manufacturing of the medicines in Australia, the rollout of clinics, and of course, the legal and ethical frameworks and other protocols that are necessary to support this whole emerging field. So with that, I think Ilana is uh, David next. Oh, just I think that one more slide, Ilan, just this next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say to all of you, um, there are many supporters and donors of ours uh, on this webinar and on all our webinars. And I just want to encourage you, the webinars are free. Um, but while Peter and I are philanthropists, we can't do what is a major mission on our own. And we just want to encourage you all to help us in whatever ways you can support this movement because this is personal for every one of us. If it's not us, it's someone who's close to us who is suffering. And these treatments have the potential to prevent further suffering and suicide. So please help us in any way you can. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce Professor David Nutt to you. Professor, over to you. Thanks, Tanya. Um... Can I share the screen? Yes, good. Well, it's a pleasure to be talking to so many people, um, largely in Australia, but also elsewhere in the world. And again, congratulations to Mind Medicine Australia for really leading uh, the, the, the global community in terms of educating and training people in the value of these uh, medicines. And um, it's good to be uh, invited to talk to you a bit about the neuroscience, because as I will explain, it was neuroscience that got me interested in the clinical utility rather than the other way around. So just a few uh, declarations of interest. I do advise a couple of companies that have a, an interest in this space, Compass Pathways with Psilocybin, Awaken with MDMA, and Psyched Wellness with Amanita. And when we're talking about psychedelics, we're talking about a range of different substances. So many of them are, one of the most common ones are shown on this slide mescaline, magic mushrooms, ayahuasca, a cocktail of two plants that make DMT available in the brain. Amanita muscaris, a muscimol containing, GABA containing mushroom much used in, in Northern Europe and Siberia. There's a little Roman mosaic showing how you can make mushroom tea. And then ergot and the derivatives of ergot, which were discovered at least by the ancient Greeks and may well have underpinned their particularly powerful experiences called the mysteries and may have led to much of the expansion of thinking in ancient Greece, which has underpinned uh, most of Western society today. But I want to talk about neuroscience. And the first, this one of the very first discussions about neuroscience of psychedelics came with this man, William James, who was one of the fathers of the modern science of psychology. And he took mescaline, he took nitrous oxide. And then he realized they changed his consciousness. And he argued, therefore, that there were many different types of consciousness. And they were separated by the filmiest of screens. But he couldn't study them. But he wanted to. And this quote here, I think, is a fundamental challenge to science. No account of the universe in its totality can be final. That leaves these disregarded. And that is a challenge it, to some extent, my group and others have begun to pick up now. With now we have tools to study the uh, nature of the portrait consciousness with psychedelics. So if we're going to talk about the neuroscience of the brain, we need to understand a little bit about how the brain works and what we now know about the, the way in which the brain essentially perceives the world and reconstructs memories, etc. So let's just start with something straightforward like visual perception. Your brain is not a camera. When you're looking at something, 
light photons go from the scene into your retina. The retina then does a very large amount of uh, activity, turning the various aspects of the visual scene into electrical impulses, which pass up the optic nerve into various parts of the visual cortex. And a large chunk of the back of the brain is the visual cortex. And different parts of the visual cortex reconstruct the visual image. So some one part looks at where the things are happening, what's happening, how it's happening, color, movement, etc. They're all decoded from these electrical impulses in different parts of the visual cortex. And then the brain reconstructs what it thinks is out there. And that reconstruction is extremely critical because the brain is, a, is an inference making machine. It, it, it predicts what's out there. And it only bothers to change its prediction when something changes. And that's what makes the brain an enormously powerful computer, 10 times more efficient than any known computer today, because it doesn't, it predicts rather than um, simply counts. But what you see and what you hear, et cetera, is determined quite a lot by the limitations of how you've been brought up and how your brain works. And this is the wonderful quote I like to use from the, the writer and painter, William Blake. Man sees through chinks of his cavern. We don't see the whole world. We tend to see what we're focused on seeing. But for, but for most of us, those chinks will let us see an image which is pleasant, so, you know, a blue sky with white clouds. But for some people, depressed people, they tend to see a gray, miserable world. And people with addictions, they tend to see a world which is focused on their love objects, like the bottle or the syringe or the white powder. And there's another wonderful quote from William Blake, William Blake which really sums this up. And uh, he talked about humans' mind-forged manacles. And this is... I think one of the fundamental insights we now have is to how the brain goes wrong in disorders like addiction and depression. It, it's not the mind particularly, it's probably the brain, but they, it manacles people into a state of thinking from which it's very hard to escape. And we believe that psychedelics now can help break these manacles. Of course, the big breakthrough in terms of psychedelics came with the discovery of LSD, this semi-synthetic ergot derivative by Albert Hoffman here. Um, here he is at 100, he lived to 102. And um, many of the pioneers of psychedelic work uh, lived for very great ages, suggesting that the, the idea that these drugs fry your brain is actually just fantasy. But um, Hoffman was so convinced that psych LSD and other psychedelics would revolutionize psychiatry and neuroscience that he promoted wide use of these drugs. And, uh, and, and they were very widely used uh, until they got banned. And Tanya's already mentioned the Nixon war on drugs that led to the banning, and I haven't got time to go into that today, but if there's another talk that uh, I have already done from my medicine, which covers that. I want to focus now on the modern neuroscience, which, which really started with an understanding of the pharmacology of these drugs. And, and this is a, a very famous graph, which, uh, in, which compares the activity, the affinity, the stickiness of different psychedelics to the serotonin 2A receptor with their potency in humans. Here's LSD, very high affinity, very potent microgram quantities. Here's psilocybin, lower affinity, less potent. Here's mescaline, lower affinity again, less potent. The fact that the potency is totally predicted by the affinity at the receptor tells us categorically that these drugs work through that receptor. They're all agonists at the receptor and subsequent studies now have shown if you block the receptor with antagonists, you block the effects of psychedelics. So we know it's the two-way receptor that mediates these effects. And where are these two-way receptors? Where this is a heat map of the distribution of these receptors in the brain. And you see that they're highly expressed in these areas of the brain, which are the anterior cingulate cortex and frontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. Very low expression in the brain stem and relatively low expression in areas of the brain which psychedelics don't affect much like the, like the motor cortex and the sensory cortex. And these areas of the brain which have the highest density of the 2A receptors are the most evolutionary recent parts of the brain. And they're certainly the parts of the brain which give humans their special capacities over other animals.
in terms of cognition, uh, thinking, imagination, planning, etc. So the 2A receptor is intimately linked with the very highest, most sophisticated aspects of human thinking. And we also know that these receptors are, are, have a particularly high level of expression on a, a group of neurons called the layer five pyramidal cells. And for those of you who don't, aren't neuroscientists, I'll just briefly explain how the brain works. Essentially, the brain is a, is a, th a three-dimensional computer. The first dimension um, are the, uh, these neurons which work in the cortex in this vertical plane. And these are the, these are, these are called cortical columns and the primary processing of inputs uh, from outside and also inside uh, are made by these neurons. There are about 100, over 100 billion of them and each one is a little computer itself. And that is why the human brain has more computing power, one human brain than all the computers on earth today. But that primary level of computing is done in the cortical columns, but then to integrate the vast amounts of uh, activity across the brain, you have to share that information. That information is shared by outputs from these layer five middle cells. And they cross, they're the neurons which integrate brain function. They're critical for making the brain work as a, as a sophisticated whole. And, uh, and these are powerfully disrupted. You can see the disruption by a psychedelic. Psychedelics depolarize these. They also activate the neurons, especially into neurons, which regulate them. And they produce a profound alteration in the function. And so essentially they disconnect the brain. They produce a disconnection syndrome uh, through stimulating these uh, two sets of neurons in the layer five of the cortex. And this is the first image we ever generated when we started doing fMRI with psilocybin. And we were absolutely staggered um, to discover that despite the fact that our, our volunteers had profound psychedelic experiences with a lot of visuals and a lot of alterations in ego and, and sense of space and, and, and also sense of understanding of, of the self in the world, the brain wasn't turned on. When you see images like this, blue means less activity. And we realized very, at that point that um, people like Timothy Leary were wrong, that psychedelics don't actually turn on the brain, they turn off the brain. Uh, and that's become a very important aspect explaining how they might work in disorders like depression and addiction. At first, we didn't believe this. This was an arteriospin labeling study. We went away and did a bold, uh, fMRI bold study, and came with the same results, published it in PNAS and, and then started to think about what the implications of these were. And one of the most important uh, implications is this disruption that, uh, of the default mode network that Tanya's already mentioned. So if we just look at the top images here, when, if you're looking at something that's red or yellow or hot, those areas of the brain which are hot are hot together. And the hotness reflects the connectivity of this group of regions, which is called a network. And it's called the default mode network. And the reason it's hot is that these, in this, this scanning procedure, people are lying still, they're not hearing anything, they're not seeing anything, they're not moving. And all they're doing is thinking about themselves. And when you do that, reflective self-thought about the past and the future is encoded in this, these parts of the brain, the frontal, posterior and lateral parietal regions called the default mode. And that's where your, your sense of self is. And that's where your Freud would say your ego was. And, and if you're a spiritual person, that's where your spirit is. And this default mode is fundamentally disrupted by psychedelics. They completely wipe out the default mode. And that's why people often feel that they don't even have a sense of self, that they can float out of the scanner and wander off into different universes, etc. because you break down the parts of the brain which regulate your sense of self. And that's where we get to this image that um, Chanya has already shown you, which is an image of essentially connectivity in the brain. On the left-hand side of the normal state, most of the connectivity in the brain is around the edge. And that's what we call the small world brain. And that's why the brain is very efficient. It doesn't need to connect everywhere all the time it's because it's good at making these predictions. Obviously, there has to be some cross-brain connectivity. If you see a, a car coming towards you, then you need to run to get out of the way. But mostly the brain talks to, regions of the brain talk to themselves in this small world. 
But under psychedelics, that process is broken down. And so connect connections can be made that have generally been suppressed since you're a baby. So the, this, is the this is the state the brain starts in and gradually it becomes more and more efficient at doing what it needs to do. And it ends up like this. And, and a lot of the control uh, that forces the brain into the small world is driven by uh, the default mode network. And by disrupting the default node network, we can put the brain back to where it was uh, very much in the early days of development, when all things are kind of possible and all connections can be made. And it's that alteration in brain connectivity, which does two things. Is that it, we believe it allows people to understand better the reasons why they think wrongly, uh, and also come up with new solutions so that they can think differently about their problems, their depression or their addiction. And that was with psilocybin. You get the same thing with other psychedelics. Here's the, the image he, we produced with, um, with LSD. And LSD, again, on the left-hand side in placebo, this is looking at visual cortex connectivity. Here's visual V1 and visual cortex. It hardly talks to anything else except V2 and a little bit of hippocampus to, to do, which is about memory. But under LSD, the visual cortex is connected everywhere in the brain. And the more connected it is, the more... Um, profound and, and uh, expansive of the visual hallucinations. And based on these work, we came up with this kind of this idea that there really are two separate uh, consciousness streams in the brain. There's the normal state, which you're all in now, which is the state of trying to listen and learn and to lay down facts. And that's driven by the neurotransmitter called glutamate. Everything you've learned from me today has been encoded by glutamate working at one or two separate glutamate receptors. And this is fantastically efficient at parcellation. It gives you an enormous amount of definition of very fine detail. Five xc 2 a stimulation, on the other hand, produces a, a very different state. It doesn't interfere with this. You can, people can remember it in great detail, the, the experiences they have. But the content is changed, the, the valence is changed. Often there's an increased sense of meaning and there's integration, often the, the, the fusion, like synesthesia, different sensory experiences, etc. but also making sense of things in a, a way which really only happens when you have perturbed the traditional way of thinking. So I think this is quite an interesting way of con conceptualizing how these, there are two separate dimensions of consciousness. So why did we start working in depression? Well, that was because it's a huge problem and treatments aren't very good and there's increased prevalence in young people. But, but that isn't a reason enough to start working with psychedelics. And the reason that we started to think about psychedelics for depression was given in this image here. So this is a fMRI bold image and it shows the decreased activity in the anterior cingulate cortex with, um, after psilocybin. And particularly in this region here, and this is a region called the medial prefrontal cortex, and a whole range of different treatments for depression reduce activity in this cort in this part of the cortex: SSRIs, CBT, sleep deprivation, ECT, even placebo. If you get better on placebo, there's less activity in this region. So this seems to be a region that is peculiarly uh, linked to the generation of depression, and in fact, it is the region that generates much of the symptomatology of depression. And we know that because if you do deep brain stimulation into this region, then you can switch off depression. And you may have heard there was a paper published yesterday showing that that's actually also been replicated now. So we thought, well, if, if we can depress activity in this region with psilocybin, maybe it would have an antidepressant effect. But there was also the, this perturbation of the default mode network. And about the same time as we produced our paper showing that, this group produced a very interesting paper in depression, showing that the default mode in depression here is occupies a much greater amount of brain than the default mode in normal controls. And that's really interesting, because it, it, the first reason it's interesting is it predicts things like rumination, the default mode is about thinking about yourself. And if you depressed people spend a lot of time thinking about themselves, they think negative thoughts about themselves, but they're over-engaged with this internalized thinking. 
And the other, other aspect of it is if you've got so much of your brain engaged in thinking about yourself, you've got less capacity to do other things. And that's why depressed people struggle with executive tasks where they struggle to remember things, pay attention, et cetera. And the, this overactivity is driven by the overactivity in the subgenual region here. So we thought too much default mode in depression, psilocybin disrupts it, maybe it'll disrupt depression. And it did, and this is the first study we did. We took people with severe depression who'd failed on at least two antidepressants. They'd failed on, uh, some had failed on more than 10. They'd all had CBT, they'd failed on CBT. And a single 25 milligram dose produced a profound improvement in depression mood, often a day after. We measured it formally at one week. And you can see half the patients had actually gone into remission. This yellow bar here is remission, no depression. And some are still well now, some are still well eight years later. The majority, however, the depression's come back. And why that is, is not clear. I suspect it's because many of these people have been depressed for decades. And so their brain, the normal state of their brain is a depressed state. And it may take more than one treatment to uh, keep them, uh, keep the depression at bay. And that's something we're exploring at present. As a result of that study, we then managed to get funding from a charity to, um, to do a comparative study uh, with the SSRI, escitalopram. This was published just earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine. And we got two measures here, the two core measures of um, the trial, which was two doses of psilocybin, a high dose for the psilocybin, 25 milligrams, a low dose for the escitalopram, the psilocybin people, then got placebo, the escitalopram people got escitalopram, but they all got the same level of psychotherapy and they all got some psilocybin. And you can see if we're looking at well-being scores, much greater improvement in well-being on the psilocybin after the first dose and some more improvement after the second dose than escitalopram. We're looking at depression, oops, depression scores as rated by the quids, the self-report score, very powerful reduction in depressive symptoms in this group, as we saw in the previous group, and persistently better outcome with psilocybin than with escitalopram. Although escitalopram did very well. And that's probably because there's quite a lot of psychotherapy around the dosing days with the, when they had the low dose of, um, of escitalopram, uh, of psilocybin. So escitalopram certainly worked as well as it has previously, but psilocybin was somewhat better. And if we looked at remission rates, psilocybin remission rates were about two to three fold greater than they were following um, escitalopram, looking at remission rates at six weeks. Now, we're not the only people to have done this work. There's a very interesting study that recently came out um, from Johns Hopkins where they looked at psilocybin here versus waiting list control and showed that psilocybin was much better at reducing depression than just waiting. So um, that, that confirms really what we've known now, a growing body of evidence that psilocybin can work in depression and it can also work in anxiety and depression that's related to fears of dying when you have cancer or some other life-threatening illness. There've also been some trials in smoking and, uh, and addiction, smoking and alcoholism. And now, as Tanya said, there's, there are studies going on for other disorders. And also, I should point out that in Brazil, there have been a couple of trials of ayahuasca for depression, and they, all, and they work as well. And what brings all these together, disorders together is that they are internalizing disorders. They're all disorders that people get locked into ways of thinking and behaving, which they don't want, but from which they can't escape. And they're all characterized by cognitions that are self-referential and ruminative. And a couple of years ago, Robin Carhart Harrison and I put together this paper, which kind of tries to make sense of the role of serotonin in depression and also the way you can lift it through different um, kinds of uh, treatments. And the, we believe there are two fundamentally different ways in which antidepressants work. Traditional antidepressants block the reuptake of serotonin they increase serotonin in the limbic system. The limbic system is highly uh, enriched with uh, the 5-HT1A receptor. That's an inhibitory receptor. And what increasing serotonin here does 
is to dampen down the limbic hyper-responsivity you see in depression. And that then allows the limbic system to recover. Uh, so SSRIs are to depression what um, a plaster of Paris is to a broken leg. You break your leg, you set the bones, you hold the bones together, protect them in the right mode with a plaster of Paris. And then over a period of weeks and months, the bones reset. And that's what happens with antidepressants. They reduce stress reactivity. The brain can then heal. But oops, the cost of that is it by blunting stress reactivity, you also can blunt reactivity to other things, particularly good things. So you can get a, a degree of emotional blunting, which is one of the unwanted side effects of SSRIs. And of course, the other drawback to them is they take weeks to work because that, you, the brain has to heal itself. Whereas with psychedelics, they work in the cortex. The cortex is full of these 5-HC2A receptors. And I've shown you, if you stimulate them, you disrupt cortical regulation. You become a, have a, a cortex which is much more open, um, much more connected. You can break down these perseverative negative thoughts. And you can lift depression very rapidly because you break the depressive thinking. But also you can improve people's sense of self and improve well-being as well as reducing depression. So this is the theory that we've been working on. And in fact, we will soon be publishing a, a very interesting paper where we compare brain imaging following psilocybin and brain imaging following escitalopram. And I can tell you that they are different. Now let's moving on to the last part of my talk, which is about MDMA. Here's a, here's a little review that we managed to get published a few years ago in the British Journal of Psychiatry. This is Alexander Shulgin. Here's the is a psychedelically a psychedelicized molecule of MDMA. There's his wife who pioneered its use as a therapy. And for quite a long time, a decade or more, MDMA was made and by Shulgin and used as a therapy for psychotherapy in the west coast of the states. It was called empathy and everything was fine and it was very helpful in couples counseling. And then some, unfortunately, some profiteer running a nightclub in, in, in Texas decided, oh, well, this is legal and it's an amphetamine-like drug. So they started selling it and it became widely used. And of course, the, the way it was promoted was to change its name from empathy to ecstasy. And that then drew its to the attention of the media who absolutely hated the idea that people might have, you know, people might be having ecstasy. And, uh, and it was banned. But MAPS, um, the American group that have been pioneering the, the use of MDMA, fought, have been fighting now for 30 years to, to put it back into therapy. And they, I think they're very nearly succeeding. They've managed to do several phase two trials in PTSD. They've now published one phase three trial in PTSD. And this is, um, and this is very, very encouraging. And it raises a really fundamental question. If you can treat PTSD with MDMA, how does it work? And if you're interested, this is a little uh, review that I wrote with Harriet DeWitt a few week, months ago in, in, as a sort of commentary on the, um, the MAPS phase three study. And what we know about PTSD is that the memory, the factual memory and the emotional memory are encoded in different parts of the brain. And the emotional memory is encoded in the amygdala and in order to recover from uh, PTSD, most therapies require reliving the experience and allowing the emotion then to be suppressed or extinguished. And for many people, that's not possible. The emotion overwhelms them. They can't engage in the therapy. Whereas MDMA, because it dampens down amygdala reactivity, can allow um, people to actually actively engage in therapy with, uh, of their PTSD. And that effect of amygdala to reduce, sorry, the effect of MDMA to reduce amygdala activity, we showed a few years ago, again, using fMRI. And here you see images of uh, arteriospin labeling of that uh, in the brain, here's front, here's back, following MDMA. So these images are quite different from those of psilocybin. They're, again, they're, 
It's reduced activity, not increased activity, but the reduction is largely in this um, area here, the amygdala and hippocampus. And, we all, and, and it's depressing that reduces the uh, fear response, the, the physiological response to the remembered fear. And also you, we can show that it, it affects the connectivity between the uh, amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, which is an important um, pathway that regulates PTSD. So we know that MDMA can dampen down the amygdala and explains why you can actively engage in the right therapy without dissociating or becoming over anxious. Now, as a result of that imaging study, um, Ben Sessa was, was, was working with me, um, came up with the idea, well, maybe we could treat alcoholics who've been traumatized with MDMA. And um, it was an interesting idea because as I guess many of you know, um, many people drink with PTSD drink to dampen down the memories of their trauma. And in fact, alcoholism itself ends up becoming a trauma. So we did a study and uh, where we basically did the same as the maps. We did two doses of MDMA as part of an abstinent-based um, alcohol therapy course. Uh, and the results were quite remarkable. Here you see in the black line, you see the number of people consuming more than the government's thresh recommended threshold of alcohol per week in, after getting MDMA. So at the worst, a third were drinking more than that. Whereas the red line is what normally is our normal outcome from our normal therapy without MDMA, where you see by and large, by, um, by three months, two thirds of people have relapsed. So this is a profound uh, benefit of MDMA, it appears. And we're now in the process of setting up to do a, a double blind randomized trial to see if we can replicate this because these were separate groups. Oh yeah, one other thing. And just over here, we were particularly interested in the fears that have been put out that MDMA might cause depression a day or two later, the sort of Monday blues. And in fact, what we showed here was these are, this is negative mood on the palms. You showed that after the first dose of MDMA, mood actually improved by one, two, and three days later, it didn't get worse. And this, after the second dose, there was no difference. So we put to bed the idea that even in quite ill people with alcoholism, uh, MDMA doesn't lead to any negative mood effect one or two days later. So I wanna finish now by just thinking a little bit more about addiction and how, how MDMA might work in addiction. I've explained how it might work in PTSD, but how might psychedelics work in addiction? And um, we think the idea is that they're disruptive of the brain process of addiction. So just very briefly, uh, this is a simple idea of how the brain, it, the four regions of the brain are, work in a balanced way to regulate decision-making. Uh, you've got hippocampus and amygdala, which is uh, where the memories are encoded. You've got the nucleus accumbens, ventral pallidum, where rewards and pleasure and, and predictions are made. You've got the prefrontal cortex here, which is where you do your high level decision making, your cognitive control. And you've got the orbitofrontal cortex, which is the final output pathway. And that's where the motivation and salience are uh, decided. And normally the prefrontal cortex controls everything. It produces what we call top-down control on the orbitofrontal cortex. And so if the reason you're all listening to me now instead of running out and having a drink or taking a cigarette is because your prefrontal cortex has determined it's going to do what it wants to do. And it's making sure that all none of the other uh, regions can take control. Now, in the addicted brain, several things change. The first is that the reward value of drugs or gambling goes up. The second is that the emotional relationship between the uh, or the relationship of emotions and reward become quite distorted and the prefrontal cortex especially with some drugs uh, particularly very high doses of drugs like say crystal meth can lead to this being damaged so it, it reduced it has reduced ability to control the orbital frontal cortex so this excessive drive and the reduced top-down control allows people to break out of their self-control and just end up doing the repetitive behaviors of addiction. 
often without wanting to, often despite not wanting to, people just do what they've always done. And we think that disrupting these addiction circuits can restore the balance in the brain. And, and what we need to do is disrupt the circuit connectivity between the emotions and reward and disrupt the relationship between reward drives and the decision-making processes. And we, our current model is this, is that MDMA works to prevent the amygdala drive leading to people wanting to change their state and take drugs. And ketamine and other psychedelics like psilocybin, they disrupt these um, processes where uh, the excess drive leads to um, the prefrontal cortex becoming disengaged and the orbitofrontal cortex becoming overengaged. And the other point to make, and this is really important, is that psychedelic and MDMA therapy, it's all with psychotherapy. Now, we haven't been able to prove that psychotherapy is vital, but we think it seems so obvious that we haven't, well, we've never got funding to do an experiment where we didn't do it, it would seem also unethical not to do it. So we, we're pretty convinced that there's it's this relationship between the perturbation of the brain and the psychotherapy, which goes on either during the sessions with MDMA or after the sessions with psychedelics, that leads to the good long-term outcomes. So I'm gonna finish now by just, uh, quoting from another great uh, writer and uh, philosopher, George Bernard Shaw, those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And I think what we've shown is that psychedelics can change the brains of our patients. Uh, and that changes their ability to control their minds. And what we want to do now, and I think what, what I'm hoping that you as, a, as an amazingly large group of interested individuals can do is begin to change the public's mind. And most importantly, change the politicians' minds because if we, until we do that, we can't bring them back into medicine. But uh, we must do that for the reasons that Tanya has explained. The needs are so great. And now we have mechanistic explanations as to how these drugs work. I think we're in a much stronger position. So thank you very much. I'm going to just, uh, I want to make some acknowledgements to this team in the Psychedelic Center at Imperial Medical Research Council who funded the first um, study with psilocybin, the Beckley Foundation, who helped fund the uh, imaging studies, and mostly the Alexander Mosley Charitable Trust. They funded the escitalopram psilocybin trial in memory of their son, Alexander, there, who he committed suicide um, in a period of um, uh, difficult to treat depression. And uh, I want to finish by showing you here. This is the old Bailey. These are the scales of justice, which supposedly underpin the British legal system, they're being put together here. And, uh, you know, what I would really like is to have drugs and drug policy properly evaluated and not continually being treated as a, some kind of political weapon. So enough of that, and I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Well, firstly, um, hang on, sorry. I've just got to get my video on. Sorry, guys. Firstly, a huge round of applause to uh, to David. There's Peter behind me, by the way. Uh, and David, if you could hear the applause, it would ripple out through the world because <laughs> um, we're so appreciative of, of your knowledge and your wisdom. There's an enormous amount of questions. And if you have got questions, we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, a couple of people have asked about the summit. I'll just quickly show you who's speaking at it and incredible topics. Ilan, if you just pop that slide on for one moment, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So this is the incredible lineup of people who are speaking at the summit. Of course, you can see David there and there's Gabor Mate, Rick Doblin, Johan Hari, Ben Sessler and so on. So we really encourage you to join us for this. There's a two day introductory workshop as well with Dr. Bill Richards, um, Nigel Denning and Trail Dowie, which is a wonderful way to learn more. And there's a special offer for all of you on this webinar tonight, which is MMA 2021, which will give you special discounts off when you go through the checkout. I'm gonna take that off now and go to all these questions. Thank you. Grace, did you wanna, did you, were you near the top? Because there's so many questions 
spread out through here. I don't want to miss anyone who, who wants to um, ask some great questions. Um, but um, this lady, Caitlin, um, I've had mental illness my whole life, I currently have postpartum depression. I went on antidepressants during my pregnancy. They sent me insane and I ended up in ED. I'm terrified to go on them again. Would you recommend psychedelics in either a micro or macro dose? I'm at the end of my tether at this point. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, you know, I, it would be unethical for me to comment on anyone's mm. clinical situation without being, you know, I, all I would recommend. No, absolutely. You know, doctor, and but also be just keep following what my medicine is doing in terms of compassionate use. If that becomes possible, and your doctor then recommends it, then yes, I don't think there's any reason why you shouldn't consider it. Absolutely, and Caitlin, if you reach out to us, um, we can put you on a list to be informed of of trials and updates and. And you know, just by registering for tonight, you should get updates about all the upcoming trials and so on. Grace, do you have another question there that you can read out because I'm just going through gazillions of comments here. Yeah, we had um, quite a few questions about microdosing yep. psychedelics. Yeah, okay, so I'll answer that. Yes, yeah, so I mean, it's a, the, the jury's out on microdosing. I mean, um, it's been very, very, difficult to study because it's illegal in most countries so um, we've had permission to do a LSD microdosing for four years but we've never managed to raise enough money because they ins the, the ethics committee insisted that every microdose had to be given in hospital and they had to stay in for a day so we couldn't afford to do that so there have been studies of single microdose showing marginal effects on things like attention um, there's never been a proper study of repeated microdosing we did a sort of a, 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 a public sort of um, person's um, attempt to do this by, by doing self-blinding. We published this in, uh, uh, earlier this year, a guy called Balak Sagetti led it. Uh, and microdosing, we showed that microdosing was largely driven by the desire to get better. So the placebo, if you thought you were having microdosing, even if you had placebo, you did well. But it's not, it's not, it's just plausible that microdosing will have some utility, probably more in terms of protecting against depression than lifting depression. But it, over time, repeated microdosing might lift depression, but we've got no evidence yet. There's a question here, um, David, from Michael, which says, what journalism, what journalism content would you like to see more of regard, regarding the neuroscience of psychedelics? Lots for the public. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think, I think, yeah, I think, the, I think we've now got to a situation where where I, I think kind of most neuroscientists would accept this. I think a lot of psychiatrists would accept the science is meaningful. We need to get it into the public arena um, with some, you know, simple words and simple diagrams. And, you know, hopefully there's some journalists here that can do that. Michael, maybe you're a journalist and you want to do a story or anyone else. Citizen journalism is big time. There's a question here from Marsha who says, how do psychedelics react with the antidepressants pills? Yeah. Yes, big, very important question. And the answer is, um, they don't they don't interact badly. It's just that many antidepressants block the effects of psychedelics. So the biggest challenge we have in treating people who have failed on antidepressants or other kinds of treatments of depression is that many of those medicines block the effects of psychedelics. So we have to get them off them. And that, of course, is challenging for two reasons. Firstly, there's a risk of relapse, which is what we've seen. And secondly, there's also some people get discontinuation symptoms, which can be um, difficult to, to manage. So that is a that is the biggest issue at present as to you know, how we deal with it. Um, uh, but if you don't come off them, it's difficult to get a good response to the psychedelic. And actually, that's the important distinction from ketamine. One of the advantages of ketamine, it's not as good as psychedelics for depression, but it does work even if you're on an antidepressant. But then you have to you have to take it perhaps, you know, twice a week for, for weeks. So it's a, it's a different model. And David, some people, you might have already said this, but some people have mentioned about the tapering off of antidepressants so that they can, you know, have these treatments. And some people suggest that microdosing is a good way to lead up to, to that. Is, is that correct? Do you think? What's your opinion on well, that? Microdosing, well, that's <laughs> I mean, the pharmacology of microdosing will be completely, you know, there will be no microdose effect if you're on an antidepressant through the pharmacology. Absolutely. You can't get a no, I mean, I meant as you taper, as you taper off though. 
or well, is I, don't, I, I suspect that the, I suspect that the microdose won't have any effect on anything until you've been off an SSRI for two or three weeks, frankly. Yeah, like, yeah. If it blocks the effects of a macrodose, it's pretty likely to block the effects of a microdose. Yeah, yeah. no, that's right. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Dan. Are you, um, can you share your view on any research into the treatment of bipolar disorder using psychedelic psychotherapy? So I know there is some research starting there, but would you like to expand on that? Yeah, well, we've always been very concerned that um, we might drive people into mania. Um, so we've not done that. We've already excluded anyone with a history of bipolarity or schizophrenia or psychosis in our studies. I think the group in San Francisco are going to try us a trial of um, a psilocybin in bipolar depression. Um, I mean, as long as you do it carefully, I mean, and hopefully it won't make things worse. It, the thing is, we don't know whether it'll work if you're on an anti manic agent you know if you're on a mood stabilizer they might it might well block the effect certainly some of them there's no question some mood stabilizers will block the effects of psychedelics so you'd have to come off those so that's the first risk we're not sure things like lithium it's a bit unclear as to what might happen so the, so first you've got the challenge uh, that you can't protect people against mania if, if you're going to give a psychedelic the second is um you know it's um we don't know if it will work in bipolar depression anyway, because it might be a different kind of depression. There is biological evidence it, it, it is different. But so, I mean, it, it would be good if someone does it, you have to do it very carefully and, and very gently and with a lot of supervision. So, you know, fingers crossed it'll get done. I'm not too hopeful, but it, you know, I'm, as long as it's done safely, at least we can, might get some results. I have heard of, I think maybe one or two trials with ayahuasca of David for bipolar. Um, yeah, well, I mean, in, in, you know, the more the more people try, the better. I just want to, you know, what, what are we are really concerned about is that we, if we precipitate extreme da dangerous or even lethal mania in people, it could actually set the field back quite a lot. So, as, I mean, I don't, you know, I think it's a really important question that if you reflect on what's happened with ketamine, when ketamine first was started being used for depression, it wasn't used in bipolar, it, it, it's, and now it's beginning to be. So I think, you know, it... it it's, we will have to do, yes, there's no question, those ex studies will have to be done, but they need to be done very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Question here from Science for All. It appears that government policy around the world is still often ideologically based rather than evidence informed. What advice do you have for navigating this and integrating evidence into policy in the face of ideology? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole, yes, I mean, the answer is um, every, no, the, the straightforward answer is every time anyone tells you anything, any politician or any, anyone who's uh, in the regulatory field relating to particularly legal drugs tells you anything about drugs, challenge it because it's almost certainly wrong. Read my book. There it is. You see on the shelf there. Hang on. Yeah. Where is it gone? Over there. <laughs> that side. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a, You've switched my uh, the drugs without the hot air. That's a very good book behind behind this ear here. There you go. That's the book to show people it's got the truth about drugs. <laughs> That's a great book, and we highly recommend it. There's a question here from Fellini who says, "Do psychedelics make a person go into permanent remission, or is the same as with, or is it the same as with antidepressant therapy, and can they have relapses in the future?" No, it's well as I said, about twenty percent of our first trial stayed well forever the others relapsed and it's interesting to reflect on why that might be i think the duration of prior illness is important i think being traumatized in childhood tends to set the brain in a, in a manner which is very difficult for it to escape from depressive thinking in our second trial we haven't really analyzed the data well enough yet but we got we got a sort of sense it people who people whose depression has come on as a result of a single event I don't know if you've seen, at some point you'll be able to see the film. There's a film was made about our trial. It's called the Psychedelic Drug Trial. And hopefully it'll get to Australia, you know, when the, when the boat arrives with the next lot of prisoners. Um, <laughs> and and uh, you can see it. And, and interestingly in there, one of the persons who did extremely well um, was a South African guy who, whose depression had come on as a, as a result of a very catastrophic divorce and missing his children and that. And he did it, he did extremely well. And he stayed very well ever since because I think there was one episode he was able to then re, kind of deal with, reformulate and, uh, and, um, and get closure on. A lot of people do, do well 
to start with, but then if they've got chronic depression, it tends to creep back. And in the escitalopram comparison trial, we did two doses of, of cytosabine to try to see if we could promote or, or to elongate the response. And we're still analyzing that data. We haven't got the six month data on everyone yet. Wow, there were so many questions here, David. I'm going to rattle through some more of them quite fast. Um, this one I'm going to answer myself, but you might also want to chime in. But where is the data from before it got banned? The 1960s data on the types of cohorts is being used now. So the interesting thing is, David, Victor Cheruda, whom you know, who is our science fellow, has actually gone back and he's put this incredible research document together that actually does go through a lot of the earlier trials than the current renaissance. Yeah. And I'm going to ask Grace or Alain to put that on the chat link now, but did you also want to comment on that, David? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a huge number amount of data, and I, you know, it's, a, it's a different talk. Uh, there's a book by Masters and Houston which pulls it all together, and you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty from a from an, uh, uh, a dis, a sort of open minded person's perspective, it's overwhelming. But people say, oh well, that, they didn't know how to do clinical trials in those days, and you know, we haven't done it right, and you know, they haven't that. It's very easy to dismiss that enormous amount of data. A thousand clinical papers were published, but people ignore it and they say, well, it wasn't done under current standards. So, you know, we can't trust any of it, which of course is, you know, a, a, just a justification for not doing anything. It's just part of the stigma against drugs and against uh, um, psychedelics. But Thank the reality you, is it's a huge database. Yeah, there is, there is. And we'll put that in the chat. Um, look, another case study here, but I'll just, I'll just, um, if there's a good question here, you know, someone who has, addiction as a result of unresolved trauma. What do we treat first, the addiction or the trauma? And um, well, I know what most question. people say. <laughs> it's a great well, question. That's, that's right. And that's what we're trying to do now with, by, you know, this is why the MDMA is quite fascinating because it, it, um, it was slightly surprising to me how well MDMA worked in alcoholism. So um, we're now actually interested to know whether it works in alcoholism without trauma. And it, although, as I said, drinking and the consequences of drinking can also be traumatizing. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it, what we would like to do is treat both simultaneously. And that's why I put out those diagrams at the end. You know, it's conceivable that that's actually what MDMA is doing. It's conceivable that's what psilocybin and ketamine are doing. But we might need to form a, form a, formulate the psychotherapy to cover both. And that's, uh, that's something to think about. Someone here asked about obesity too, and I think I have seen something about obesity. David, do you, could you briefly? Yeah, well, it? it's yeah, we've written a couple of grants <clears> in the MRC of Britain to, to see if we could use psychedelics to help people cut down their eating. They've never been funded. Um, I think it's an interesting approach. Yeah, I don't believe that obesity is actually an addiction, but I do believe it's a dysregulation and it's a kind of habitual dysregulation. And it's possible that psychedelics can disrupt that. So we think there's a completely plausible case for, for, for studying it in, in, in obesity we just haven't got funding and you just want to comment on the risk of psychosis this comes up a lot and as we know in the yeah. in all the recent trials you know it's been very you know safe but do you want to just comment on that briefly well yes i mean what we, we you know as i said not studies when we've done 50 depressed people we've done several hundred healthy volunteers no one's gone psychotic one person got a bit paranoid when they're in a scanner on LSD, well, you know, actually, it's not a lot of people get paranoid in the scanners without LSD, so so that's not surprising, and, and that was that was very short lived, and it, it ended up he ended up thinking it was actually in the end quite an interesting insight. So the answer is, um, you know, we can minimise that risk by selecting people who've got low risk of uh, of psychosis. I mean, I don't think there's much doubt if you're floridly psychotic, taking a psychedelic could make it worse. So we try to avoid that. David, also here there's a question about um, ideological drivers again, you know, which we've been talking about a little bit. And do you think that trial size is a key factor? I mean, I know there was 60 people in the Imperial trial and about 100 in the phase one part, sorry, phase three part one trial of, of MAPS. Yeah, do you think that trial size is important? Well, all you need to do is have a trial that's big enough, is powered enough to test your hypothesis. And actually, I mean, it, 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 people say that, but that's they, they're usually referring to trials with current medication, which aren't very effective. So you might need a trial size of 150 in each group for an SSRI, 
but, but when you've got a drug as powerful as psychedelics, you know, actually a trial size of 15 might be enough. Yeah. I mean, there are drugs licensed, you know, on, for other disorders, neurological disorders, cancers, where, you know, the trial size is 12. But, so, yeah, again, there's, this is, a lot of this is used, this criticism is used as, because it's, it's it, I think, you know, it basically reveals a kind of prejudice against psychedelics, not wanting to accept that they work differently and maybe more powerful. Thank you. And also a question here about addictive qualities. You know, would someone come back wanting more after a trial dose <laughs> in a trial? No, example? that's a great question. We were forced mm -hmm. to look at that in detail with the MDMA study. And we, mm -hmm. we asked people when we got up to nine months, had any of them actually gone off to seek other MDMA? And the answer is no. With psych psychedelics aren't addictive, but ketamine might be. So this is another difference. So there is an issue about ketamine. Um, two things happen with ketamine. One is that people get tolerant to it, so they need more. Uh, and um, and that, you need, then that gets you into a very complicated discussion as to whether it's tolerance or whether it's a kind of getting addicted. Uh, I think for most it's just tolerance, but obviously there are people who are addicted to ketamine. And if you get addicted to a lot of ketamine, it's not good for your brain or good for your bladder. Psychedelics are anti-addictive. You know, but again, people assume they're addictive because they say, well, they're controlled drugs, they must be addictive, but they're not. Um, so the, the, the big challenge is really now to see if we can get permission to use psychedelics in a regular way, maybe, maybe every six months to help people with chronic depression, keep their depression at bay. I would be very comfortable doing that because I don't think there's any risk of addiction, but, but I'm, I know that the, you know, the, our antagonists, our critics will, will start saying, oh, well, you know, you're not really curing people. But then actually very little of medicine cures people. <laughs> so, you know, we, we shouldn't set ourselves an impossible barrier. <laughs> dream and, the impossible dream. Doing. That's right. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Andrea. Do you think that psilocybin may induce epigenetic or intestine, intestinal microbiome alterations that can be in some way involved in its therapeutic action? Well, psychedelics unquestionably do produce changes in the brain. They produce changes in brain circuitry. They produce changes in brain um, anatomy. They increase synaptogenesis, etc. Those are unquestionable, and those are those are by definition epigenetic changes. Yeah, whether it affects the microbiome, I have no idea. No one's ever complained of of changes in bowel habits afterwards, but we've never studied the microbiome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, by the way, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. Like we're swamped, but. But um, we really welcome you to send them through. Grace um, handles our inbox, don't you, Grace? It's a huge inbox. And we will endeavour to answer all the questions. And if we can't, we might send a list of them to David to send back answers for you. So we will endeavour to answer all your questions, you know, over time. So if we don't answer your question now, don't take it personally. It's literally that, you know, <laughs> there's just a lot of questions here. Um, well, I've got 10 more minutes. Okay, <laughs> good. Well, we'll, we'll rush then. Um, just a question here, which I will answer, which is any discounts for the unemployed to attend the November conference? Indeed, we've just announced a big concession rate today. Um, and so Grace or Alain, Grace, could you, that's on our website now. So Grace will reply to you. Um, and it's on our website now. There's a concession rate for our summit that's just gone online today. For those of you that have unemployment, um, student concessions, health care, visibility cards, or, or whatever you need. So that's a huge discount. Um, let me just see, sorry, there's so many here. Uh, please, can you be added to the list for trials? Absolutely, please send your, send your, your requests in. Uh, brain, gut again. Um, what are your thoughts about potential next generation psychedelics with different pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties? Yeah, it's are a great current, question. Yeah. Are the great current question. psychedelics an adequate toolkit for treating mental illness in the long term? Then that well, goes back to your six monthly checks, but also this other point. Yeah, so there's a very interesting in which is do you need uh, do you need uh, Hour cyber get better, or the twelve-hour Ellis gain, or fifteen-minute DMT trip work, and those those study going, and it'll be really, view is that you know, a twelve-hour LSD trip is actually too long and too demanding for people. 
uh, um, and too expensive. I don't know if if a fifteen minute DMT trip lift depression as well as psilocybin five hours. Well, that's very interesting. Um, my well, we'll gut see. feeling is it won't, but we'll see. We'll see. Keep reinventing those molecules. And then there's one here. Question about anorexia, David. I know that you're doing yep. well, Imperial's been doing some work on that, and also Johns Hopkins. Yeah. Did you want to comment? Yeah, yeah, we yeah we put four, our fourth patients gone into the trial uh, last week. Uh, People tolerated it very well and uh, been very generally very responsive to the um, to the model and uh, it, it's definitely safe, which is one of the questions. Well, so far, we've um, and um, the psychological effects have been powerful and for the first three people um, beneficial. Whether it'll affect the long term outcome, we don't know. We, our, our major variable is 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 eating attitudes at six months, so we don't know what that is yet. But we will. But it, anyway, the good news is it's. It was concerned it wouldn't work in people with anorexia, but it seems to, at least pharmacologically and psychologically. David, I, there's a question here I'm going to leave you to ponder on for just five minutes while I go through the final slides. And it's a great question here from Kyan, which is, what, in your opinion, is the future of psychedelic neuroscience? So I'm going to come back to you in five minutes for a quick answer on that, if you don't mind. And um, for those of you that we haven't answered your questions, I'm sorry. Um, but please, um, we'll try and answer them in other ways and please reach out. We are really approachable and we're very responsive. So we will come back to you pronto. Just very quickly, Ilan, um, these last couple of slides. So we do have a psychological support service that provides the harm reduction service effectively that provides guidance to you with psychologists and psychotherapists around Australia. Um, if you need guidance, in using the medicines pre or post. And this is legal. Unfortunately, we can't provide you support during your illegal experience, but we can provide support during pre and post. So, and we can't encourage you to do this, but we can provide support, including integration support with some wonderful practitioners. Next slide, Ilan. Tim Ferris there, who says, you know, he views the next five years as a golden window to affect millions of lives through your donations and your support in this space. Next slide, thank you, Alan. Lots of ways to help. You know, we have state and regional chapters, I mentioned them, we have a great learn section and we have some partnerships with drug science as well, which David is the chair of and some wonderful content with them. Talk to other doctors and medical professionals. Amazing how many people don't even know what psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is. And so please inform them, share them the link. Please help us in any ways you can to support this movement through your own donations, whether it's, you know, the equivalent of two cups of coffee a week or more significant donations. We can get there and we can make sure that Australia is a leader in this space and we are doing everything we can to achieve that and to make these medicines accessible. Talk to your local MPs, attend our events. Next slide. Thank you, Alan. Join your local chapter great place to meet other people in your local community and get to know people interested in this space. Um, and next slide, thank you. And we have a wonderful online course as well that we'll announce a new date shortly coming up soon. Next slide. And a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. This is a wonderful four month part time course. I mentioned it earlier, we encourage you to register for it to become a psychedelic assisted therapist or to have this as an adjunct to your current practice. As I said, many participants describe it as the best training that they've done professionally, period. Um, and the faculty is extraordinary. Next slide. Um, the rescheduling. So uh, yes, well, we've had the independent review last week and um, now we're waiting for these final decisions in December. And the next slide. A uh, couple more events before our summit. Well, the relationship between sex and psychedelics with Hamilton, Hamilton Morris, fascinating guy as well. I encourage you to register for him. He really is wonderful. He did that program called Hamilton's Pharmacopia. If you haven't watched it, it's worth watching. We'll take that off now. Go back to the chat screen and David's going to tell us about the future. <laughs> He's going to yeah, gauge so think his crystal ball. <laughs> you want me to tell you what we're going to do, huh? <laughs> Well, I don't mind. I don't mind telling you what I think the future is. because <laughs> So I think there are two main directions uh, in terms of the neuroscience of psychedelics. The first is 
how they produce their enduring changes, what's the nature of the neuroplasticity, what mediates it at the level of the synapse, at the level of the, of the sort of postsynaptic um, um, biochemical processes inside the cell. And there's a huge interest now in actually stimulating those processes and seeing if you can get the same effect as you can uh, with psychedelics without a psychedelic effect. There's papers published now showing in animals you can do something similar. So these drugs are called plastogens, and so they might they might be healing drugs without the psychedelic experience. I, again, my suspicion is that they probably won't, but they might have some role. But there's a, the, the, the nature of the adaptive reframing or the you know, neurological remodeling of, of thinking is really interesting. And the other one, of course, is what uh, we've been in, you know, encouraged to do since the work of uh, William James 120 years ago. We need to, psychedelics are the best tool for studying altered consciousness, and we should be definitely using them where we're start, if we're interested in consciousness. It's, they're a fundamental tool for that. And we hope to be doing more of that as well. Oh, very exciting about that. And what was that lovely first quote you gave in your talk? There was a beautiful quote you gave right at the beginning of your keynote today. No account of the universe in its totality can be final that leaves these disregarded. So basically, the, if you want to, you know, sci it, this is a fundamental avenue or question for science. And that's why scientists should be in this field in as much as clinicians. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, David. We are extremely grateful, as always, for your wonderful support to Mind Medicine Australia. Everyone, uh, a lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Great. The professor. Yeah. Anytime. See you soon. I'll see you Thanks. next week or whenever. Next month for my other talk. All right. See you. Oh then. yeah, yeah. You're always on. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there's any other questions, um, if anyone wants to um, speak, please please feel free to unmute yourself for a moment and ask us any last questions. We we quite like having a little bit of interaction as we wind up. If not, it's fine. We can wind up. I can't see all the hands because there's so many people registered and I imagine there's a lot of people who have registered who are going to watch the recording and we will put the recording up and send you um, Grace if you could get um, David's presentation to share that would be wonderful as well and we'll share that but ah oh, yes Gos Goska Goska oh, beautiful.